Hmm. All right. Alright. <clears throat> hey Sviplet, how's it going? realized I don't think I ever uh, released the YouTube version of episode yeah I didn't seven or eight jeez I'd say it's more than a can of beans. It's the whole bean factory. It is it is all of the beans.
Yeah, the alchemy is very different. There's there's very little of like the regular Minecraft. Minecraft is almost just the the vehicle in which you travel. You know, it's the medium is a better word. Um, Cause yeah, there's there's really nothing. I guess the wither is a Minecraft thing. I mean, obviously like the blocks like cobblestone and oak and all that, but yeah, there's not, there's almost no recognizable Minecraft gameplay in uh, Ultimate Alchemy. Let's see, am I, where am I in frame? Um, I should move that a little bit more to the right. There we go. Yeah, Foundry is interesting. I, I can't decide how I feel about Foundry. I think it has some really neat ideas. It definitely, it definitely has the, some of the cool aspects of, you know, voxel based gaming, but I don't feel like it does enough. I, I mean, I've watched some videos here and there and like, the modular buildings seem pretty cool, but also not super flexible, at least not flexible enough. I don't know. It's interesting. I think there's a, a level of like, they haven't done enough to differentiate themselves from other factory games in the early game. And you don't get to some of that other stuff till 20, 30, 40 hours in the game feels a little weird and before that it just kind of feels like anemic satisfactory um so i don't know it'll be interesting to see how the game evolves but okay i probably should get started yeah, I was just checking. It's got 81% positive reviews, which is good, you know, but compared to, um, you know, Satisfactory has 95% or 97 actually. Factorio has, it got review bombed at one point, uh, still has 96%. Although I don't know if Steam's excluding that. Um, and then Dyson Sphere program surprisingly has 97%. I don't actually get the Dyson Sphere program having 97%. I feel like there's enough things to complain about with Dyson Sphere program that it shouldn't have 97%. I would expect more like a 90. Um, I'm wondering if it's the Chinese market is a big part of that. Because there's only 21,000 reviews in English. So that could be a big part of it. I don't know, you know, exactly what that means, but I just know that the majority of the reviews for Dyson Sphere program are not English, which is not the case for, you know, the other two games. Like Factorio, uh, what is that? 116,000 out of 149,000. So that's like, what, 80, 90? No. 80% is English? Yeah. And with Dyson Sphere Program, it's like only a third is English. Or less, less than a fourth. Yeah, Alor, that's also interesting. There's a a uh, like a minor thing that like mines blocks by extending forward, which is really cool. Um, but apparently that's not unlocked until like tech level four, which feels like, in my opinion, that should be like the second thing that unlocks. It should be right after, you know, your drones that are mining things from the top are starting to get a little too slow. 
because that it's just such a cool mechanic, you know, to like have this mining machine underground. And I feel like you should introduce that early, not late. Um, I don't know. Various thoughts. OK, I need to get started with the podcast here. As always, feel free to participate in Twitch chat. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Factory Must Grow Episode 9. Today, we're flying solo again with some Twitch chat chiming in uh, from time to time. It's been a nice week for me. The summer weather is finally settling in, so there's warmth outside and the air conditioner has to run, but I enjoy that. Um, (laughs) I hope you guys are all doing well. Today on the cast, we're going to start with another mod spotlight. We're going to discuss the Factorio Friday Facts 411. Can't believe we're already over 400 Friday facts. And then we're going to discuss some automation game design um, assumptions or norms that uh, I think questioning the norms is always a good thing to try out once in a while. So what is today's mod spotlight? It's going to be a bit of an unusual one. I normally have been spotlighting Factorio mods, mainly because those are the only mods of automation games that I know a ton about. But today we're going to spotlight Satisfactory Plus. This is a mod for Satisfactory, obviously, and it was made by Hyloon and Kyrium in May of 2021. It has over 100,000 downloads and the biggest overhaul mod for Satisfactory. Um, As far as I can tell, it is it is certainly an overhaul mod. It, It changes like all the vanilla recipes. It you know, changes the buildings. It uses multiple other mods in itself. So it's kind of an overhaul mod that includes other mods, almost like a Minecraft mod pack a little bit. It uses the refined power mod. It changes power slugs around. It changes the alternative recipes. So it's really a fresh take on the game. And I think that's pretty cool. So it it says that there's currently eight tiers available. It's in alpha, quote unquote. And it takes you all the way from the basics through liquid metals, uh, which is definitely new to Satisfactory. Um, There's oil processing, there's advanced ore processing, all the way to titanium processing is already in the mod. And I haven't tried it myself, but looking at some videos online, it looks really cool. And I wanted to highlight a Satisfactory mod, partially because I know a lot of you are Satisfactory fans. And also because some of you didn't even know that Satisfactory has a modding scene and it does. And it's very much alive. The website that you get Satisfactory mods from is called fixit.app. And that's F-I-C-S-I-T, I I think. Am I missing a letter? F fix it. Yes, (laughs) sorry, (laughs) it took me a second. F-I-C-S-I-T dot app. And that's where you'll find Satisfactory mods which is pretty cool. And I think the fact that fixit.app is such a good website is part of why they uh, delayed official mod support in Satisfactory 2 after 1.0. They did still sound pretty certain that they were going to add official mod support after 1.0. It just isn't going to make it into 1.0. And I think that's because they were kind of like, well, the community has already done a bang up job of it. So why do we need to add it into 1.0? I still don't know if I fully agree with that um, mentality. I do feel like official mod support is pretty important and I think they will still add it. I just I'm guessing they just didn't have the time and they they had to crunch something out of the schedule. So anyway, there are satisfactory mods and satisfactory plus looks like a really cool overhaul mod that I intend to try myself probably after Uh, I play through the Satisfactory 1.0 experience, I'm looking forward to trying out Satisfactory Plus, which at that point, of course, it will be even further developed, assuming, you know, it doesn't get uh, dropped or something. So, yeah, go check out some Satisfactory mods. There's lots of quality of life mods or go check out the overhaul Satisfactory Plus. Um, Moving on to the next thing today is the Factorio Friday Facts 411, which 
it's a pretty straightforward Friday Facts again. Um, in this case, they're talking about the asteroids. It's titled All About Asteroids, and it's really uh, another in-depth kind of look at how they designed something where no new content is actually spoiled. So we already know there's asteroids, you know, when you're flying around on your space platforms. We already know that you collect ores from them and we already know, you know, those things exist. So there's no uh, there's no new content spoiled here. But they talked about how they didn't want like boring two dimensional sprites just floating. And so they tried giving it rotation. But then even that still looked kind of boring and they had to have all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And if they were going to do animations for like rotation, then that could be confusing. So instead, they opted for having fewer sprites, but using a lot of uh, shaders and lighting tricks to make them look more kind of alive and real. And it's pretty cool. So they kind of went through the different steps they took. And I won't go into massive detail here because they've got cool images online where you can like drag the slider from left to right to see like, oh, this is before we added the effect and this is after we added the effect. And so I highly recommend going and checking out the blog post yourself. But to kind of summarize it, they took the first thing they wanted to do was differentiate the, the different resource types of asteroids. So there's metallic, carbon, and oxide based asteroids and essentially the metallic ones are kind of these pitted convex shapes almost like if you were to have acid eat away at something almost like if you tore a sponge into pieces you know there's these kind of like holes taken out of it uh, so those are metallic ones the carbon ones look more like i'd say normal asteroids they're kind of like lumpy blobby smooth ish shapes kind of like the moon you know, the actual moon looks kind of that shape. And then there's oxides, which look more like crystals, uh, which I think is like the ice crystals and stuff like that. And so first they remade the sprites to have normal maps so they could apply shaders. They added diffuse lighting, which uh, allows the non lit sides, I think, to have some light. They added specular lighting, which is for like the shininess. They added subsurface scattering. So like the ice could like let light through it in some ways. So there's all sorts of little tricks that they used and applied in order. And then the asteroids also rotate. And with the rotation, it actually updates the, you know, the lighting angle. And so it does really add this three dimensional look to it, even though it's still just a 2D sprite that's rotating left and right, you know, that it's not like you're not getting a new angle of vision on it. And yet it still looks very 3D. It's really cool how they actually pulled it all off, to be honest. And I would I would definitely go check it out because it's hard to describe in words what it looks like. But uh, they also talked a little bit about uh, how they did the space dust that kind of flies by when you're flying on the platform and like the background asteroids and how they made those show up and not look too repetitive, but also not take a lot of performance. So as always, the Factorio team, you know, doing a great job on just adding these cool visual effects without huge performance hits. And they're always super aware of that. So I think that was pretty cool. Lots of cool details in there. Go check out the blog post yourself. I do think um, we're all kind of ready for the next planet to be spoiled. Uh, there were people on the Reddit that were you know, talking about, oh, it was 12 weeks from when this planet was spoiled to the next planet and then another 12 weeks. And so they were expecting this one to be 12 weeks. And I think now it's like two weeks past that. And so I think people are starting to get a little uh, antsy for the next one. But, you know, we're all just hungry for spoilers, aren't we? So that makes sense. Um, one thing uh, someone's saying on Twitch, Sviplet says, reading between the lines, the Factorial Friday Facts is suggesting they could use similar techniques for other entities, which they do not discuss, perhaps because they haven't been revealed. Of course, this is speculation. Uh, yeah, I agree. I do think they're going to use these strategies for some other things, uh, especially on the planets. Um, they could even use it for... I was going to say they could use it for something like the player tank or the player model where you're, you know, you're rotating around as you walk or travel. But the problem with that is then you're kind of implying that the sun is always at a certain angle. And right now, you know, we have daytime and nighttime, which implies the sun is rotating around and they would have to change the angle of lighting based on the daytime. 
and I and then they would have to add normal maps to every single entity. Otherwise, the shadows would look all wrong. So I don't think they're probably going to do that. I, I mean, they could. It would just be a lot of work that they haven't revealed any of yet. So it's always possible. Um, yeah, biters, they could apply some of those things to and they don't have to necessarily apply the the normal maps, which is like the lighting direction one. They could also apply some of the other strategies, which are cool. But all that to say, lots of cool stuff from the Factorio team, and we will continue to cover more news as we get to it from there. Uh, the main topic we're going to get into today is why are things the way they are? Why do it be like it do? Um there are lots of norms in the Factorio or factory automation genre that I think are worth questioning. They're worth challenging even. They might be good. They might be bad. They might be somewhere in between. I mean, they're usually somewhere in between, let's be honest. But I think it's worth kind of chatting about some of the some of the norms and kind of asking ourselves, is this is this a good norm? Is this just here because it's the way things are and the way things have been you know i i think in a lot of gaming genres we get so used to the norms that we forget to ask whether it's a good thing or a bad thing one example of this is quest markers on a mini map or even on your compass hud at the top of your screen you know i think about older games like Morrowind, which didn't have quest markers. You would talk to a character and you would get a quest and it would describe, oh, you go past this mountain and then turn, you know, you take a left and it'll be over there and you kind of have to actually read words and figure out where to go. There is a map in the game, but it doesn't put a quest marker on the map where you're supposed to go. And I think that's actually really cool, right? And but now every single game, I, I cannot think of, of very many exceptions, at least in a similar type of genre where you don't have quest markers, you know, and it's like even linear map games sometimes have quest markers where it's like there's not even a lot of places you could go. And they're still kind of like, you know, guiding you with a little shining light. And, and I just, you know, it's it's become a norm and I can understand why, like it caters to maybe a good way to put it is the lowest common denominator people who don't want to work very hard for their games you know just maybe the average joe who wants to sit down and run towards a quest marker and shoot some bad guys or whatever and i get that but i also think you know game design needs to be innovative in some ways and it needs to take some risks and it needs to do some things sometimes that players don't know they want and at first they might not want it, but then once they once they have it, they realize, oh, that was actually really good. It's kind of like the eating your vegetables um, idea. Sometimes, you know, you don't really want to eat your vegetables, but once someone has forced you to eat a salad or vegetables or whatever, you're like, OK, that was actually a good idea like that. That tasted great and it was healthy for me. And I'm actually really glad that somebody made me eat vegetables. And I think video games can do that too. And if they're just trying to make the most money all the time, these companies are often not offering vegetables to players because vegetables don't sell well. But I do think if you want to make the best game, it probably has some vegetables in it. And we've even seen the Factorio team, back to factory games, talk about things like this. You know, they even reference the, uh, you know, players will optimize the fun out of the game type thing, which was a statement from uh, Sid Meier's team about civilization. And so it's like you have to design the game in such a way that players can't necessarily optimize the fun out of it because they're going to try. You know, they're going to try to take all the shortcuts. They're going to eat all the chips and popcorn, uh, you know, and you're going to you sometimes you have to force it so that vegetables are the only way through, which they might complain about, but then eventually be thankful for. So. I know that's a very uh, I take took that analogy maybe farther than I should have, but I just kind of wanted to to start with that analogy as we start to talk about some of the specifics. So the first thing I want to get into is the player having an actual character in the game world rather than uh, what I would call like a strategic command overview, which would be reminiscent of older RTS games or simulation games like City Skylines or SimCity or even The Sims, you know, where, where you as the player of the game are just controlling things from usually some sort of top down perspective. But a lot of games these days allow the camera to move around and kind of fly around a bit more freely 
and you don't have a player character. There's no you. There's no avatar in the game, right? And it has become a norm for factory and automation games to have an avatar. I mean, you know, you look at Autonauts, you've got the little player running around. You look at Factorio, you've got the engineer. You look at Satisfactory, you've got, well, your engineer character. You look at Minecraft and, you know, you're Minecraft Steve still, even in, in the modded versions where you're doing very automation-y things. And you look at Dyson Sphere Program and you've got your commander thing and you look at... I had one more and I forgot it. Uh, I didn't name one of them, but... Uh, Tectonica, you've got a character. Foundry, you've got the robot character, right? And so all of these games, you have an avatar. Does that avatar actually serve a purpose? And I mean, obviously, yes, it serves some purposes, but are those purposes worth it? Are the pros better than the cons? You know, so let's dive into that a little bit. Um, I kind of made a basic pros and cons list, and I'm just going to read through this real quick, but then we can kind of dive a little bit further into them. And... I want to also just give a disclaimer. I am not a professional on these topics. I am a journeyman in game design. I, I find the topics very interesting, but you know, I, I do realize there are a lot of things I'm going to miss. There are a lot of things I'm not going to think about. Um, I don't claim to have all the right answers for these things. And some of them, there is no right answer. They're a matter of opinion, but I wanted to muse on these. And so if you either disagree or agree or have additional thoughts, please join the discord and come chat about it. We have a lot of fun over there. Uh, so we'd love to hear what you have to say. So let's uh, start with the pros list of, you know, having an avatar. I think one big thing is that players like to have agency, right? So having a character gives this immediate sense of agency, like I'm the one who's moving around the world. And I, I think there's a huge difference between 3D and 2D games. Right. So and I do lump Dyson Sphere program into the 2D world. It's a little bit more 3D because of the sphericality of planets and the ability to travel between planets. So you get a little bit of that like three dimensional movement, but you're still building your bases on a 2D plane, uh, you know, on the surface of the planet. Um, something like Autonauts, definitely 2D. Something like Factory Town is... 2D, you know, you can build like elevated things, but it's still mostly a top down perspective and you're mostly building things, you know, in one layer with conveyors and other things crossing over each other. But you're not generally like building entire bases in a bunch of layers like in Satisfactory. But then you have things like Foundry or Satisfactory or Minecraft where it's very three dimensional and you could have 50 layers to your base. And those are obviously going to be very different between the pros and cons list for players having an avatar. So let's start with the 2D games like Factorio, you know, where where you're mostly playing in two dimensions. So I already mentioned players like to have agency. Uh, movement can be fun, right? It can be fun to move around like you can run around. There's little footstep sounds. You, you see the player moving. Um, so that's a pro. Movement can be a challenge, right? So Rygard was on the podcast last week talking about how he feels that Squeak Through is a cheaty mod, which he's technically not wrong, right? Because it removes a challenge of having to design your factory to be walkable. And so not being able to walk between buildings, you want to design your factory so you can move around it easily. I have seen many people in Factorio playthroughs place a long belt in both directions so that they have almost like a little people mover conveyor that they can hop on and run somewhere faster. And so, you know, none of that would exist without the player having an avatar, right? It, there would be no point. So there are fun challenges that that rise up when movement is a thing. Um, it gives a sense of scale to your factory by having a character with a more or less fixed move speed. Uh, obviously, you can upgrade it, but when you upgrade it, you then understand that you're moving faster. It gives a frame of reference. It gives a scale to how big things are, how big the game world is. And I think that adds a lot to the experience, right? So in like Pyanodons, when you've got these buildings that are 23 tiles by 23 tiles and it takes a while to run past a row of just seven of those buildings, you really feel the scale of how big things are. And it makes you feel small in a way that's really fun. 
you know, when you're running through your factory and you're like, I am tiny compared to this massive block of assemblers and inserters and rails and all this stuff. So I think a sense of scale is much more experienced when you have a player character that moves rather than just a camera floating. Uh, one big, I think there's a couple big things that I haven't even hit on yet, which is uh, combat. So combat is massively different with a player avatar, right? And and that one alone is almost enough of a question that like games could decide for it or against it on this question by itself. Because obviously when you have combat in your game, you have a, a shoot button, an aim mechanic of some sort, usually, you know, Factorio is mostly auto aim, but has a few things you can manually target, which I think is actually a really good blend because you know, you don't really need to aim your assault rifle. Like, obviously, you just want to shoot it at the biter you're pointing at. And so I think that works pretty well. Um, but, you know, when you're in a tank, you want to be able to shoot your explosive shells in a certain direction and stuff like that. So I do think the combat, I would almost say it's not necessarily a pro or a con. It's more like combat is kind of impossible to do in the same way without an avatar because if the player doesn't have an avatar you would have to hide it underneath like oh you're taking control of a certain tank and there have been rts's in the past where they've like given the player the ability to you know zoom into a soldier and like play it from that soldier's perspective or something but i don't i don't know of any games like that that ever really got huge and were super amazing if there are let me know because that sounds cool but you know, I know some games have done that. I just I don't think it's ever been a super popular mechanic. And I don't think, you know, in a in a Factorio style game, if you didn't have the avatar, you would probably be able to build tanks and command them around RTS mode. I think that would make the most sense. And that's how a lot of strategy games work in uh, strategy games that aren't RTS, but still have combat. Often you can, you know, select your units and command them around still, even if it's not an RTS. Um, yeah, so all that to say, I, I do think there's there's a level of if combat is a part of your game at the core, then it would be a very different game whether you have a player avatar or not. So I do think that's a big, you know, a big uh decision point if you're designing a game with combat it's like are we going to go with the more autonomous combat where the the player is the commander of the units that are doing combat or is the player the unit and i like that factorio allows you to kind of control the spider trons later which kind of allows you to say hey i'm the unit for now like i'm the thing that does the shooting i'm the thing that hops in the tank but later i can get these spider tron remotes and then i can tell them to go do the combat and that does feel like the natural progression of like, I'm doing a thing. It's kind of tedious. It, I, it's risky. I might die. But later I can have the Spidertrons do the thing and it's automated. Now, you can't fully automate combat in Factorio in the sense that they just run around and kill things and automatically go back and repair themselves and get more ammo and all that. But it's it's more automated in the sense that you can just tell them to go walk over a nest and it'll get it'll get blown up. Um. Yeah, so a few people are saying some interesting things in uh, Twitch chat. So one thing that was mentioned is um, Captain of Industry. I completely forgot about Captain of Industry, which is funny because I'm doing a playthrough of it right now. So I don't know how I forgot about it. But yes, Captain of Industry is a factory game that does not have a player avatar. There's no player. There's no inventory. There's no combat. Um, if there is combat, I... I don't, I'm pretty sure there's well, OK, sorry, there there's like the ship combat, but that's that's more like a mini game that happens. I, don't, I wouldn't really call that combat. Um, so, yeah, the there's no player character and it really doesn't feel weird. Like when I've played Captain of Industry, I don't get this feeling that something's missing. I, in fact. I don't even think I've noticed there's not a player avatar. Like now that I think about it, of course, well, there's not a player avatar and I've known that since I started playing the game. It's it's a very obvious difference when you look at it, but I don't think I noticed it as a difference. It didn't feel wrong. It didn't feel weird as I was automating things and getting things set up. It's not like I was like, oh, there's just something about this feels wrong. Um, 
So all that to say, I think they've done a really good job creating an automation game where there is no player avatar. I want to get to the cons and then I'll talk about another game as well. So, oh, sorry, I had one more pro. The last thing on the list, and this is another huge one that, again, is really difficult to solve without a player avatar. So I think a lot of games go with having a player avatar for this reason alone. Multiplayer. In multiplayer, it gives each player an interaction point with the other players, right? Like in in multiplayer Factorio, people do funny things like building belts underneath somebody else to make them go in a little circle or whatever. And like it gives you this sense of like, oh, this is where my friend is and I can interact with them and I can build walls around them and, you know, play pranks on them. And I know where they are. I know where their attention, at least, you know, in the late game, you can do a lot of stuff remotely, but in the in the earlier game, like I know where their attention is focused. I know where their inventory items are living right now. Um, so so all of that is kind of collected in this idea of an avatar in multiplayer. And imagine if you were playing a multiplayer game where you don't have an avatar. Well, how do you really manage that? Because then you don't know where other people are. You don't know what they're doing. Um, you know, I'm trying to imagine Captain of Industry multiplayer and and everyone would be able to interact with the world. But how would you interact with each other? You know, and I, I think that allows. Having the player avatar allows for a level of interaction, which is fun and enjoyable. That's not possible uh, without the avatar. And so I do think that that adds a, a, a cool factor. Um, another game that doesn't have avatars that I wanted to talk about is Factory Town. It's, it is an amazing game, first of all. It, it's a little, um, what's the right word? I don't think obtuse is the right word. It's a little different. It's almost like uh, someone had a dream about a factory game and they designed a factory game. Um, <laughs> and, and they weren't just looking at all the other factory games for inspiration. It, the the UI is a little obtuse. I will say that it's a little different, but it's really fun. And I highly recommend you guys try it out if you haven't before, because it's different and it's really addicting once you get into it. And there's no player avatar. There are little characters that move around and collect things, but they're more like workers, kind of like an RTS. And I don't think Factory Town suffers for not having an avatar. It feels very natural. The game flows really well. But again, if you were to play multiplayer Factory Town, that would be a little weirder. Um, I, I don't know exactly how that would work. I know uh, this is a little bit of an adjacent genre, but uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, there's open RCT2, and I believe that that has multiplayer. And that's another game where you're designing things from a top-down perspective. And again, it's like, you just see things popping into existence when the other players are creating those things and you don't know where their attention is focused. And I do think, you know, you can always add in a system where it shows you where their camera view is like some sort of highlight thing. So you can at least sort of follow what, what the other players are doing. People can still ping each other even if they don't have characters. But yeah, all of that, I think, you know, is is a lot harder. So those are all the pros. Let's talk about some of the cons to having a player character. One of them is that it makes the larger scale of things sometimes more complicated because you have to move your character around to actually do the building. Um, and this is where Factorio solves the problem a little bit by having bots and you can build blueprints from the map view so you don't really have to run anywhere. And so I think Factorio does a good job of solving the cons um, satisfactory, eh, not so much maybe because it, it really, it doesn't solve that problem because blueprints are still only medium sized and you do have to run around and build a lot of blueprints still. So satisfactory in some ways is restrictive because of having a player avatar. I do think that that's an intentional design decision, but it also is worth noting that if you were to design satisfactory from the ground up again, without having the player character, I do think you would essentially be more capable. Um, now, of course, exploration would be way less interesting, right? Part of, part of satisfactory is the exploring of the game world. Part of it is moving around. Part of it is enjoying the movement, unlocking the jetpack, right? So, so it would be a different game if it didn't have that. I'm not arguing that and I'm not even arguing it would be better with or without the character. I'm just saying it it would 
you would be able to do more factory wise if you didn't have a player character. And I, I don't think that's really arguable. Um, but clearly the, the pros outweighed the cons in the developer's mind. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, one thing that's being talked about, and I, I thought this had been on my list, was inventory is a pro and a con that comes with a player character, right? And so the player character is a way for an inventory to actually be fixed to a location that can move and it stays with you, the commander, quote unquote. Whereas if you were playing a game like Factory Town or Captain of Industry, having an inventory wouldn't really make sense because it's like, well, where would that be coming from or going to? And if I'm sometimes you have like a home base type building and you can only build within a certain radius of it. And that kind of emulates a player inventory in some ways. But I do think having a movable inventory via an avatar is a good way to kind of allow the player to take resources from point A to point B without having to set up logistics for it. Uh, that's something that Alor was mentioning in the Twitch chat is like you can you can have a floating inventory without having to like set up logistics from point A to point B. You don't have to have a belt. You can just pick it up in your inventory and walk it over there. And that's nice. Right. And and. There's less ways to do that that makes sense without uh, having a player avatar. So it's kind of like a, a sense of the fine, I'll do it myself idea, you know, in game form. Uh, some of the other, the other cons of having a player avatar, it can be tedious, right? Like if you're getting from point A to point B, sometimes you just want to move the camera over there and start working on the thing you want to work on. But no, you have to actually walk there or fly there or swim there, you know, whatever mechanic you're using, whatever game you're playing. It's often not easy. And sometimes that even costs you resources. Like in a Dyson Sphere program to go between planets, you need like those jump resources. I can't remember what they're called. It's been a long time since I played it. But, you know, sometimes that's a negative because you're like, oh, I want to go over there and visit. Oh, but I need that thing first. And of course, that can also be a pro, right? Like they designed it that way so that you do have to produce things to be able to travel between. And you're supposed to think about the cost of traveling between these places. But it's still it can be this sense of like those pros of having more things to design and more things to figure out to get there comes with the cons of sometimes the player just wants to do the thing and then they're stonewalled by having to oh wait i have to produce more of those fuel cells before i can go to that other planet and blah 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 and then sometimes that can create some tension and frustration for the player uh, another one that is more of just something to look out for for a developer is that if movement isn't properly supported in the ways that the player needs to move, it's just flat out frustrating to get around the game world. Um, you know, I think about Satisfactory in its earlier days before they had the zip lining. I think the zip lining was a big one that made it much more possible to scale up mountains. Before that, you just had to build a giant stack of those ladder. Uh, they're like the conveyor stilts, but they have ladders on the side. And you basically just had to build ladders like up, you know, five million tiles to, to go up the side of a mountain in in uh, Satisfactory. Whereas in something like Minecraft, you can at least mine blocks all the way to the top, right? And you can make yourself a little staircase. But in Satisfactory, when they added the the zip line, it became so much more doable because then you could just place a power pole on the bottom and then you could like figure out, you know, if you get the placement right, you can usually place a power pole on the top of the mountain or maybe you have to go halfway up the mountain with a foundation because, you know, you you like can't quite click on the slope, but you, you figure it out and then you can zip line straight up to the top and it's a lot quicker and it, it's fun and it's cool. And so I think they really fixed a lot of that frustration of not being able to get where you want to go. Um, I do think movement is a good thing to have as a challenge, but you don't want it to be an impossible challenge, right? And you don't want players to be mad that they can't get from point A to point B, right? That's not a good experience for players. Uh, let's see. The last thing I wanted to mention about the cons is just that it's time consuming, which I sort of touched on. But if you just want to be at point B already and you're not there, and you just want to be there, then the amount of time it takes you to get there is a, a frustration time, right? It's an that whether it's five seconds or 10 seconds or four minutes, 
that's an amount of time where you're not having fun doing the thing you want to be doing. And that can be costly um, for the gamer's experience. Now, of course, if you have added in solutions to these frustrations, such as, you know, I think of the hypertubes in Satisfactory is a good example where it literally is an idea of point A to point B without you having to do the movement. And so if there's a common trip that you are enjoy that you are not enjoying taking, you know, you can build a hypertube from one point to the other point and you just bloop pop in one end and it zoops you all the way to the other end and you get to watch the whole time and it's actually pretty enjoyable. So I do think that a lot of games take measures to remove this frustration and, you know, the devs know and they themselves probably experience some of those frustrations. But again, it's worth asking in game design, like, is the movement actually good for this game? You, you look at Captain of Industry, there's no movement. And I don't think that that costs the game anything. I think that the game is better off being the way it is, not having a player avatar. It would be a different game if you had a player avatar. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's really interesting to think about the differences. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm just looking at Twitch chat real quick. Uh, one thing that was mentioned is that the avatar is kind of like a manual override for the game. And I do think that's a good point um, because Captain of Industry has some quote unquote manual overrides as well. And it's a very different system that's more... <sighs> Uh, what would you call it? Uh, like magic, right? It has this system called Unity and you can click on a building that's waiting to be built and you can click, oh, deliver resources instantly. And it costs you some of your Unity, which is it's a renewable thing, but it also maxes out pretty low. And so you can't just use it all the time. But it kind of allows you to focus your intent as the commander of the factory into a certain spot and you can get stuff done faster. You can boost buildings sometimes with it. And there are certain automation challenges that you want to do to boost your unity income so that you can utilize more of it doing some other things. So that is the replacement in many ways for having a player avatar. If you think about what a player can do in other factory games, the Unity system allows you to emulate many of those operations. Like, oh, I, I can't wait for the automated system to get iron from point A to point B, so I'll just spend some Unity to do it. Or, oh, I can't do handcrafting. I haven't even talked about handcrafting yet. Um, someone mentioned it in, in Twitch chat, but, you know, if you can't do handcrafting, well, now you can boost a building with Unity for a little bit so that you get more iron plates for a little bit. Because in early Factorio, you know, your, your handcrafting is just as fast as an assembler and you've only got three assemblers running. So your handcrafting is, you know, just as important as the automation. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I just think those are really interesting questions to ask yourself as a dev as you're designing something, why do we have a player avatar? What is the purpose of a player avatar? It, how does movement work? Is movement a big part of the game or is it an afterthought? I would argue in Factorio, movement is closer to the afterthought category than the big part of the game category, which is why so many players like squeak through because they consider that movement is not really a part of the game that they care too much about and they want to kind of remove some of the frustrations that come with movement. And they're like, well, I don't want to have to worry about walking around my buildings. I just want to be able to walk between them. So they get squeaked through, you know, and, and I think that that's a very relevant uh, or not relevant, reasonable choice for players to make because Factorio isn't really about the movement. You know, it is just a top down 2D game. You move left, right, up, down. That's it. There, there's nothing more to it than that. And yes, you get vehicles that allow you to do that maybe faster or you get the spider tron which allows you to walk over buildings and you don't have to even run around them or between them if you have squeak through you can just move whatever direction you want and that's really nice but i don't think i don't know i i don't think that it makes movement any more a part of the gameplay experience you know and exploration is also a big topic that you want the player to enjoy movement if they're going to have to explore such as in Satisfactory, because in Satisfactory, the exploration of the game world, first of all, it's handcrafted, which is beautiful. So that inspires you to want to explore. Uh, the resources are pretty far away, so you need to explore. The hard drives are sort of hidden or in cool or special or hard to reach areas. So you need to explore kind of 
in more than just the easy ways. So Satisfactory, I think, does a really good job of mixing joyful movement. Like it's fun to move as a player character. The sliding and jumping feel good. It's not physics realistic. Like you are very floaty. You're very fast. Once you get the Blade Runners, that's even more true. You know, you and I think all of that makes it more fun rather than like, oh, we have these realistic sprinting mechanics. And, you know, you look at um, uh, Minecraft where it's like, oh, every single time you're walking up a slope, you have to just spam the jump key. You know, like that's not that fun at the end of the day if movement isn't what you're there uh, to play the game for. And so that's why a lot of mods in Minecraft add things that make movement easier. You know, same story. Uh, I do want to talk about inventory a little bit. Um, we already touched on it with like player avatar. But even then, why do we have an inventory at all? Does the character need an inventory? Like what's the purpose of having an inventory? And I do think... Um, I think it was Fiplet that said this, that the manual override idea is an is one of the big reasons why we have inventories in factory games, because it's like, oh, I don't want to have to build a conveyor from point A to point B every single time I want an item to go from point A to point B. So how else can you do that? And the answer is, well, you have a player inventory and the player can carry it. And I think that is probably the main reason why these games have an inventory. I do think it's a bit of an assumption, though, because when you have a player, the player has an inventory. That's just how every game works. I mean. If not an inventory, the player at least has equipment slots, right? Like I, I almost can't think of a game where that's not true, where you control an avatar and you have no ability to equip things or hold things in some form of inventory or <laughs> equipment slots. I'm sure there are games you don't have to spam me with all of them, but not most of them, that's for certain. Um, and so I think having an inventory allows for this little bit of like, I can do things myself before they're automated the way I want them to be automated. And it allows a little bit of that flexibility of like, you can use your inventory maybe more than you should to, or, and handcrafting more than you should to to not do automation, but then you pay for that later. And so the player is incentivized by like, oh, I'm getting tired of all this handcrafting. I guess I should automate it. Whereas if handcrafting and inventories didn't exist at all, well, you would never have that incentivization to fix something that was annoying. Instead, you would just automate it from the start. And that's more what Factory Town is. Uh, because there is no player inventory in Factory Town, you do have a hub base thing that contains your building resources. And when you build uh, objects and buildings, it comes out of kind of that like bank, so to speak. Uh, but there's no inventory. You can't move items around yourself. And so you have to have your little meeple people like carry things around at first. And then eventually you get carts and belts and better ways to transport things. But... There's also the difference between items and currency. And I'm using currency as a broad term, but if you think Age of Empires, right? Gold is just something you have as the commander of the RTS game. And you can spend gold and wood and food and stone to build buildings. Now, the villagers have to go there and do the construction of the building, but the resources don't have to get there. They're just automatically teleported. So as soon as you've collected a resource, it's in this magical bank of resources that's infinitely large. And, you know, those resources can be teleported anywhere on wh wh however you want. And Factory Town actually has currency. It has coins. And there's four different types of coins that you you get. And you get these coins by selling actual items, uh, a.k.a. things that need to be transported with logistics, you sell these items to your villagers. You know, the villagers want, they have more and more needs as they level up and you produce these items. And as you get more and more complex items, you get, you know, the higher tiers of coins and those coins allow you to do different things. Some of the things are instant upgrades and some of them are like a boost, you know, that you can have on or off, but while it's on, it's draining. And I think that's actually a really cool system because it's blending the two ideas of like there's kind of these global currencies of coins 
that accomplish certain things. And then there's the more standard items that actually travel around the world with logistics. And those are two separate categories of thing. I think they also have science. Uh, I'm trying to remember how science works, but you get research points by like making books and stuff. And the research points are also just like a, a banked resource that doesn't actually travel around the world. Um, so yeah, again, just really interesting thoughts about like, with inventories and items, what should be like a global resource that's just spendable and what should be an actual entity item that travels around the world? You have to use logistics for it. It's not just this nebulous idea. Um, yeah, so one other thought I had with the item stuff is uh, moving on to the research side of the item stuff, like research packs uh, versus just research itself. And, you know, you look at games like Factorio, you have to produce the research pack, which is an actual item. And then you have to send that item to a research station or laboratory or whatever you want to call it. And then, you know, you pick the tech in the tech tree that you want to research and it requires certain packs to get done. And if those things are happening at the same time, then, you know, you get your research and now you have more technology options to build. And you look at some other games such as, let's see, actually Captain of Industry is very similar to Factorio in that Satisfactory is pretty different because the res there's not really researches. The, the MAM, molecular uh, uh, something... Something oh, I can't remember what it all stands for. Someone will hit me up in chat. Um, but but you do sort of research some things. You throw like an object in there and it analyzes. I, that's probably what the A is, is analyzer. Um, and so you, there are like a few really short tech trees that you work your way through with items. But there's no research packs. You know, you just research with like the item that unlocks that tech tree. So like Caterium Ore is like the item that you feed it to like start unlocking the Caterium tech tree stuff, which is like the, the like radio and uh, electricity metal. Um, but yeah, so then there are other games that, you know, research is a completely different concept altogether. I'm trying to think like Dyson Sphere program has the cubes, which are basically research packs. Uh, oh, a good one. I haven't mentioned it yet because it's it's an exception in a lot of these categories is shapes and I don't know if it's pronounced shapes or shapes but it's got a z on the end and I like to pronounce the z so I'm calling it shapes until someone uh, has at least evidence that it's not supposed to be pronounced that way um, <laughs> but that one's been around for a while and it is very much an automation game but it it really cuts out a lot of these concepts there's no player avatar the resources are just infinite there's no there's no tech tree. It's simply you make the shapes that it's asking you to make. And once you've made enough, you finish like that stage or quest or whatever you want to call it. And that unlocks the next thing. And so in a way, those shapes are your research packs, but they're also what you use to create things. And it's, they're also like your resources. And so it's a very abstracted form of items and in inventory. It's actually really fun. Um, and Shape as 2 is coming out, I think, later this fall or winter. And they had like a demo that was pretty fun. So I don't I don't think the demo is still up. I think it was a limited time. But uh, I highly recommend keeping an eye on that game, wishlisting it, because it's going to be the first one's really great. And the second one seems like an upgrade in every way, like a really big upgrade, too. It's significantly different in terms of the visuals. The gameplay seems upgraded in a lot of ways, and it seems like it has longer legs as you would say, like the game will probably play longer and you'll be able to enjoy it for longer than the first one. Uh, all that to say, you know, you look at a game like Shape As and research is not even really a thing. Um, I really like the idea of the tech tree not actually being researched. Uh, Factorio just leans fully in to, to that like weird gamey thing where it's like, I'm making a science pack. Like, what even is that? Right. Like, it's literally a jar filled with some red liquid. It looks like a health potion. You know, people have called them that before. And and then you feed that to a lab and somehow 
you research a new technology that like despite you being a space faring civilization because you were literally in a flying rocket ship that crash landed on this planet you didn't know how to make an electric you know assembler like I, and I, so i think sometimes there's a little bit of this suspension of belief that or is it suspension of disbelief suspension of disbelief that these games ask you to do where it's like okay that's a fun game system but it doesn't really make sense and satisfactory tries to do it a little better because they hide it behind this idea of like the fix it uh you know like company and they're sending you the blueprints like as you're ready for them and so obviously when you first crash land on a planet there's only certain resources you even have the means to collect and so they're only like giving you the ability to utilize those things for now and then as you collect more and prove that you're capable enough to like work with the next types of things and the next types of machines and materials, then those things are unlocked. But it's not like you're researching them. You're not discovering that they exist. You're not discovering how they work. You're simply receiving those blueprints, you know, to yourself as almost a reward. And then I actually really like, to be honest, the way that modded Minecraft does it, which is just there is no tech tree. There's no technology. There's no research. You just literally can't make certain things until you have the resources for it. Once you have the resources for it, you can make whatever you want. And the mod pack designers just gate things such that you need a certain set of machines to make a certain set of materials to make the next thing that unlocks the next set of machines. And by doing that, you can make these tech tiers without having any research. And I think that's a really elegant way to do it. And right now I'm playing through Greg Tech New Horizons, which you guys probably know. But the quest book is, in a way, the tech tree. But it's not a tech tree. It's just a quest book. And it's leading you through what you can do and what you're already capable of doing. At no point in the quest tree is it unlocking something that was impossible before. And I think that's really a cool way to design progression because it feels very realistic. It feels very natural. That's how it would work in real life. You know, if there was an apocalypse and you had to go do things, there's no tech tree where you're unlocking things. You might get a book to read some stuff so you know more. You might, if YouTube still exists, which it probably won't, you know, you might need to look up some how-to videos. But, like, you're capable of anything. It's just a matter of what tools do you have, what materials do you have, and how can you work those tools with those materials to make something new. And that's how Minecraft does it. And so I do think there's different approaches to the idea of a tech tree. And right now, kind of the standard is one that I actually don't like, which is the which is the Factorio. It's the Dyson Sphere program. It's the you make some form of research pack and you select a technology and those research packs give you some amount of progress towards that technology. And when it's done, boom, you've unlocked new things. Um, I'm actually not a fan of that. And it, it is right now the gold standard. It's what most automation games are doing. And I think that in particular is one that I would say, let's ask some more questions as developers. Should we really be doing that? Is that worth it? Is that a good system? Is this the funnest thing for players? Is it the I mean, it's definitely not immersive or realistic, but, you know, let's be honest, a lot of the bits of these games aren't. So that part's OK. But at least Satisfactory does a good job of like covering that up, you know, and I think Factorio is interesting because it doesn't it doesn't really try at all to cover up the weirdness of that. Then again, it doesn't have a story at all. The most story you get is there's like what two sentences when you start the game that say like you've crash landed and uh, it says something about collecting resources or automating. I don't even remember what it says. And that's it. You know, the rest of it is just them sending you on your merry little way. Uh, so it's interesting that like the goat game has such a cookie cutter and I will use the word boring approach to a tech tree and to research and to a story even explaining that tech tree and research. Um, it's it's one area where I think the game has not even tried to improve. Now, you, you can look at why the tech tree exists and how it's set up, right? Like, and this is exactly what Satisfactory does too, where it's like, oh, we want the player to automate certain things before they get to this next stage of research. 
so that like you know you have iron plates automated and you have iron gears automated and eventually you have to have inserters and belts automated to unlock green science well those are two things that the player needs to build a lot of and so they're kind of holding your hand as you walk through the tech tree and so it's kind of this cleverly designed almost quest book in a way where they're like hey you should do this but it's kind of like a you have to do this to progress so you don't really realize we're telling you you should do it and it's almost this hidden kind of sense of ooh we're gonna give you more and more stuff um now as far as yeah spiplet you're mentioning that they didn't want to overwhelm the player and i think this is the reason tech trees exist in most games i mean look at rts games part of it is progress you know as well like you you start with a small base um but i think there's a level of like they don't want the player to start the game and have 5,700 recipes that they have to look through, right? That's too much. You don't want to overwhelm the player. You don't want the player to start the game and immediately be assaulted by all of their options that they'll have through the end of the game. And so if you don't have a tech tree, you do need to find a way to slow down that knowledge so it's not a fire hose that hits the player the moment they start, right? And a tech tree is a great way to do that. And I believe that's why a lot of games have tech trees. Um, do, do, do. <laughs> is it cookie cutter because everything copied them? Yeah, I guess that's a good question. Like, was Factorio the first one to do that? And I would say no, because tech trees are a thing in many, many, many games long before Factorio and needing some form of science like you look at civilization for example which was around before factorio and even though it's not an automation game it's at least in that direction where you're producing resources every turn and those science production bits go towards researching the tech that you have selected so i do think in many ways that was a, a video game uh standard for a while um because even Civilization was doing it in a very similar way long before Factorio. So I wouldn't say Factorio was very innovative in any way. With that, um, it was more just like, let's figure out a way to tie this into automation of items. Um, yeah, I don't know. All that to say, I, I would like some new systems. I'd like some cool systems that feel like they fit better with both what's realistic and they also still do a good job of not overwhelming the player they do a good job of walking the player through the progression because obviously progression is massively important in these games but they do it in a way that's not just i make science packs i do research i unlock new things and rinse and repeat until i beat the game because i do think that that is not that's not the iterated upon best result it's simply a good functioning system that does what it needs to do but it's also not special and it doesn't add anything to the game. I don't think anyone plays uh, Factorio and they're like, oh my God, I had to make science packs. That was so cool. You know, it's like, oh, that's just kind of like how you progress. And uh, that's not the part of the game that's amazing. There are a bunch of parts of the game that are, but I don't think that's one of them, at least not in my opinion. And I think. And I don't know if Factorio itself could change at this point because it is what it is. And I don't I'm not again, I'm not trying to hate on Factorio or say it's bad or anything like that or bash the devs. I just think there are better ways to do research and tech trees. And I would love to see some new and innovative like breakthroughs in that category. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, people are mentioning that having to make science packs kind of forces you to scale and automate in a certain way. And I agree. It is it is the method of handholding and it does accomplish that task. I think there are other ways to accomplish that same task, though, that don't involve the, the player making science packs and picking technologies from a big flow chart. Um, you know, I, I think that that I click on buttons from a flow chart to progress my technology. It just. I, I don't know. I guess all I can say is I don't think it's the best system. I think we can do better and I hope we do better as more and more of these games uh, keep coming out. I hope that we break out of that mold because I don't think that system in particular is the best. I think it is more of a it's what we've got. I'll use it because I'm focused on other things as I'm develop developing my game. I think that's why it gets used, not because people are like, oh, this is the best way to do it. 
this is the most fun for players. It's the most innovative. They'll enjoy it the most. It's the coolest. I don't think it's any of those things. It just accomplishes a lot of goals. It's a workhorse of the industry, and that's why it's there. That's my take. It's maybe a hot take. Let me know what you think on Discord for sure. Um, I've already gone, I think, a little too long. How far? Yeah, we're starting to go a little long here. Um, <laughs> I didn't think I'd get that into it, but that, that's such an interesting topic. So, yeah, all that to say, those are those are some some basic questions of like, here are some standards that a lot of factory games are doing. Should we be doing them? And some of my thoughts on those. And again, I would love to hear all of your thoughts. There are even more categories. So if there are other kind of like, ooh, automation games are all doing this thing, uh, should we be doing it? If there are other categories of that, please let me know on the Discord as well. You know, like one obvious one is like belts. Almost every factory game has belts. Very few of them avoid belts. Should we all have belts? Are belts good? I don't know, you know, like it's an interesting question. Um, belts are cool though. I, I think most people agree belts are cool. So I think that is a very basic reason most games add them and a, and a pretty decent one, to be honest. That's, that's my uh, 30 second take. But again, add your thoughts on Discord. Um, I'm gonna move on to uh, one viewer question from a couple weeks ago that I don't think I've answered yet that I just think is a quick, interesting one to, to mention. Um, is the graph, and this is a graph over time, of automation games near the beginning of its rise or will it plateau soon? Meaning, are automation games at their peak right now? Like, is this is this their heyday in the sun like RTS games in the 90s? Or is this kind of just the beginning? And we're only we're only scratching the surface and 10 years from now, we're going to have, you know, automation games that are blowing our minds. I think that's a really interesting question. You know, this is kind of like playing the stock market. I, everybody's guess is about equally likely to be wrong or right. <laughs> um, we can't really predict the future. Uh, with games, there is this, you know, there's the market driving what games get created, obviously. Like if games such as Satisfactory and Factorio are selling really well, and they're selling a lot of copies and making a lot of money, then other studios think, hey, we could actually make a living working on a factory automation game. And, you know, as much as I wish the world didn't run on money, it does. If if these games stop selling and players stop playing them and buying them, there probably won't be very many made. There, there are always people who will develop games both for free and people who will develop games at a loss. And so there will always be factory games because I think there's enough people who love the genre that the, the genre will live on. But will it be bigger than it is now? And I don't know yet. Yeah, I, I hope it is. I think it's getting more popular. It's definitely um, booming in terms of the indie scene. There's a ton of these little games coming out that are made by either one developer or three developers or a tiny indie studio. And, you know, they look like they're kind of fun, but like, is that really like that great of a game, you know? And so there is a, in terms of the number of games that are being made, we might be close to the top because I'm guessing a lot of these games are going to fail because they're not all that amazing. And it's really only the, the best ones that rise to the top. And then I think we'll probably come down a little bit in terms of the amount of games created where, you know, only people who really think they can make a great game that does something new and special are going to throw their hat in the ring. And so at that point, we'll probably see fewer games, but higher quality games. And, you know, it'll it'll kind of balance out. As far as how many players are playing the genre per day, I don't even know how I would measure that. And I don't know how I would see a graph of it. If you have ideas for that, I'm curious because that could be kind of cool if we had a way of tracking that. But I'm guessing that number will grow over time. I don't think we've peaked in terms of interest in the genre. I do think we're kind of in the heyday of like how many new games are available every month. I think we're in the heyday of that for now and maybe for a couple more years. And then I think it'll start to slow down. Because a lot of the games that weren't that great, they're just going to flop. You know, they'll have 20 sales, 100 sales, 1,000 sales, and then, you know, they'll die out. And then other people will be like, yeah, there's already like 5,000 factory games. I could make one. I have some ideas that are cool, but I can't make like 
a great new one that will blow people out of the water, so I won't try. And I think that will then prevent a lot of the smaller indie ones. And, you know, there will probably be a little roller coaster of ups and downs over the years. But, yeah, it's a really interesting question. And that's, you know, just my my take on it. Obviously, I can't predict the future. So who really knows? I'm excited to see where it's going, though. Games are just getting better and better, which is exciting. So with that, I think I will go ahead and wrap up episode nine of The Factory Must Grow. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can head over to patreon.com slash Crydax. I am so thankful to my patrons. You guys are really, really helping all the streams and podcasts stay alive, uh, put food on the table. Patreon's a great platform. You can start your subscription whenever. You can stop it whenever. You can change the amount whenever. You can pause it for a few months. Um, so, yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, you guys considering being a patron. Obviously, you know, your finances are your finances and I want you all to be smart with your money. So if you either don't have the money or can't afford it, then I don't even want you to consider supporting me on Patreon. But if you have the money and you would like to support me, then I very much appreciate uh, any support you can provide because it does help keep the show going. Uh, next week, I plan to stream the cast on Twitch at the standard time, which is Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. UTC. You can check the Discord for any updates to that time, if there are any. And if you have any ideas for guests in particular, please let me know. I would love to get some new uh, categories of guests. We've had a couple mod devs, and I'm sure I'll be able to get more mod devs in the future. But if you, um, if you know any particular streamers or content creators of Factory Games... Uh, send them my way and I would love to chat with them about what it could look like to, to interview them on the show. And if you have any other um, even game developers that, you know, you know, send send them over, send them over to me, have a message me or send me an email. I would love to chat because I'm always looking for new guests. So so please uh, reach out to anyone, you know, that that would uh, make sense to interview and they can either send me a message on Discord or they can email me. And if you also have ideas for topics or questions for me and, and really any questions like AMA, you know, it can be about life. I have a lot of hot takes on life, just like I have a lot of hot takes on uh, video games. So if you want to know anything, you know, I won't answer everything, but, you know, you can ask me anything. Uh, please leave a comment on Discord or email me at crydax8 at gmail.com. And I look forward to hearing from you all. As always, thank you guys for listening so much. We'll see you next week. And always remember, the factory must grow. I really should have taken a water break in there somewhere. My throat was getting so dry. Ugh. Mm hmm. Definitely was keeping that in for a while. <coughs> Whew. It's a lot of talking. Oh, yeah, the fa the factor Y dev. Do you think he calls it factor E or factor Y? Because like, obviously, it's the letter Y by itself. So in one sense, it would make sense to call it factor Y. But it also spells out factor E with the space between it. So just saying the word factory with a little bit of a space makes sense. Ugh, stretch. <sighs> Maths or mathematics. Yes. Now that is an interesting topic. I will probably have a uh, like viewer viewer questions like AMA type episode at some point once there's enough kind of off topic questions. I don't want that to be the norm, but but having like an off topic episode once in a while, I think is pretty fun. And so something like math is a great topic for that and just kind of like different thoughts on math as a field, math as a specifically a taught subject in schools is the one where I have the most opinions. <laughs> um, but also I just think culturally and I, I can only speak for America. I can't speak for other countries. But culturally, math is just way, 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 way too hated as a concept even. And that really frustrates me for many reasons, most of which is because it's taught to be hated. Children don't hate math 
uh, they're not born hating math, right? Like they're taught to hate math. And that's what really bothers me. I won't get into more right now, but I could talk about that for a long time. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, please do, you know, you guys here on Twitch, if you do know anybody, um, send them a message to message me. I It's much easier if people reach out to me, obviously, than me reaching out to them. I'm happy to reach out to people and request like, hey, would you want to be on the podcast? But that's more like cold calling. Whereas if you have a personal connection with someone, then you can tell them about the podcast, send them a link to the podcast, and then they can on their own time check out the podcast and decide if they want to reach out to me. And that feels a little bit more organic because I don't want to like pressure people to be on the podcast. But if they want to be on the podcast, I'd love to have them. And there are a few people that are definitely worth cold calling just because I think they're awesome and, you know, I'd love to have them on. But yeah, as you know, if you guys are in other discords for devs or content creators or, uh, you know, mod devs or game devs. Um, I'm interested in all of it. So yeah, it's true. Most people don't like things that are hard and math is hard for many people, partially because of how it's taught, partially because they're told it's hard. I agree with that. Um, but yeah, it is, it is interesting. It is very interesting. I just wish it was more culturally accepted. You know, it's even like I've told people before in life, like I'm a math teacher and people are like, oh, God bless you. And it's like, what? What? You wouldn't say that if I was a history teacher. Like you hear the word math and your brain just goes to like, ew. And that just is so sad to me because it's just, I don't know, it's just logic. And the fact that the concept of like, applied logic to numbers is so anathema to people when they're constantly watching shows about detectives that are applying logic to solve something and they love that right it's like that's the same thing you're just doing sherlock holmes but with numbers instead of like a crime and somehow that feels completely different um it feels completely different so yeah all that to say um Maybe I, I should talk about that on podcast. I clearly have a lot. Uh, Alor and Dave, I agree with you guys um, as well. Like, I, I think I agree with both of these takes. So, like, I agree that you get less people if I'm doing it the way I talked about earlier. And I still would like that. However, I also will do, like, just reaching out to people um, and inviting them to be on the podcast. I definitely wanted... Fewer people. Thank you. Yes, Swiplet. Grammar. You know, gotta have the grammar Nazis. Um, is can you even call them grammar Nazis nowadays? That's still okay, right? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> grammar pedants. Uh, anyway, all that to say, I am I holding this? this? Is my like nail file thing? Um, I lost my train of thought. It was in response to one of you. Uh, I think half of what I was going to say is tell me who you guys think I should have on the podcast and I will reach out to them based on if they have like an email on their YouTube or something and invite them. Oh, that's what I was going to say. I was going to just say that, like, I wanted to get a few weeks of the podcast under my belt before I started inviting some of the bigger people because I at least wanted a few examples of what it would look like to be on the show, right? Because, like, Dosh is huge. You know, Nilaus is huge. I would love to have Nilaus eventually. Um, like, Kovarex. Yeah, obviously that would get uh, a lot of views. Like, I'd love to have him on the podcast. But I at least wanted an example of what it would be like to be on the podcast for those types of people who probably get more requests um, because they have to pick and choose their time a little more carefully. And they also realize that they are in some ways endorsing me. And so they want to be able to check like, is this just some weird tiny guy who doesn't know what he's doing or which they might see me as that, which is fine. Like, I just want them to kind of get a little bit of a grasp of like, who am I? What does the show look like? What does it look like to be on the show? And I think now that we've got, you know, eight or nine episodes, and I've had some of the 
you know, I've had some big streamers like Bold Viking and, and stuff on, and I've had Rygard, who's a dev at Wuba. And so, like, having some of those under the belt feels like I can now hand that to some of the bigger streamers and be like, hey, here's some of the people I've interviewed. Like, I'd love to interview you, too. And I feel a little bit more like, yeah, I don't know, uh, qualified, I guess. Maybe qualified is the wrong word, not qualified. Um, it's close to the right word. I like trying to find the right word for every situation. Michael Hendricks, that would be fun. <laughs> yeah, having having hundreds of videos on YouTube doesn't hurt. Yeah, credentialed, I think, is a better word for it. Yeah, more more like credibility. I think that's the word I'm really looking for. I think I have more credibility now. Not necessarily that I'm any more qualified for it, but... <laughs> Oh, yeah, totally be Jonas. And even if it was a problem with me, I still wouldn't be personally offended because like I don't love every streamer or YouTuber that's out there. And if they don't love my vibe, they might not want to be on my podcast. And that's fine, too. Like I, even if they personally don't like me, like as a as a player of the games or a podcaster of the game genre, I'm OK with that, too. You know, because it's not like it's not literally personal, like, oh, I just don't like him um, kind of thing. So I don't even really mind if people just don't love my vibe. Anyway, I do need to head out for today. There will be more Greg Tech videos coming out and. I would like to stream more. I think part of why I'm not streaming more is I'm I'm a little bit in a Pyanodon's rut. And so like I am enjoying the one stream a week, but I'm not feeling like I want to do more than that right now. And I think once I switch to another game, there might be a little bit more excitement to stream an extra time or two throughout the week. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I'm also considering uh, just streaming Captain of Industry since I'm already playing through that one anyway. And I am enjoying it, um, but I'm, I'm still not 100 percent on that yet either. Haven't decided. So stay tuned for all that. We'll still have quite a few more pie streams. I mean, at least I said sometime in June. So we've got at least three more at the minimum pie streams and we've already almost got logistics bots which is crazy uh but yeah okay well i will see you all later uh as far as rating i'm not gonna rate anybody but you should go watch uh well i don't have a ton of people uh the only one i see is laureen llama is playing rim world and she's pretty awesome uh she's rated before and we've rated her so check it out I'm glad you've been appreciating the the Zen approach. I don't know if I feel Zen when I play, but uh, I do like it sometimes. Um, and as far as specific invites, B. Jonas, I appreciate the recommendation, but can you put that on the Discord channel for The Factory Must Grow so I have it kind of in like a, a place that I won't forget it? I would appreciate that. And I will see you all later. Thanks for hanging out. See you later, Spitlet. Salsa, don't worry. Someday, someday Melvor, Melvor will happen. There's actually a reasonable chance I at least do one stream when the when the expansion comes out. There, or at least not necessarily like the day it comes out, but after it comes out, I might get it at some point and stream it. Because it is a fun game. And I do think a lot of people who follow my channel might like it as well. <laughs>